Hello, our first talk, or first real talk today, is by Anton Dollmeier about how to email in 2021. Enjoy. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Anton Dollmeier, and welcome to my first talk at a uh, DEPCONF at all. So I hope um, I fulfill the expectation on this one. Um, as indicated in the title, I'm going to talk about how to send and receive emails in 2021. So a lot of that changed over the last five, six years. Um, as you all know, email itself is not that new. So in 1969, uh, the first message was sent uh, on the ARPANET. I guess some of us already have been alive at that time. I don't want to point pink, uh, fingers on that one, but at least the internet is quite, uh, it's not that old as it seems. In that, at that time, we had mailboxes. Um, obviously, that changed a bit since then. But what did not change is the SMTP protocol. So in the basics, SMTP is still the same as it has been um, those 50, almost 50 years ago. Obviously, when we want to send emails, um, we need to talk about sending the emails first. And for that, I have brought up some nice picture, which essentially is still the same as in 1969. So what do we have? Um, obviously, you need a domain name. Uh, most of us already have that, and it's working. And to actually receive the emails, um, you need the um, a mix record for that. And first of all, you need to send the email to a so-called submission service. Um, in the past, this changed. So we had the SMTP port used as submission as well, uh, which did pose some issues. For example, if you remember in the beginning of the uh, in the 2000s, um, Deutsche Telekom introduced the block of port 25. Um, AOL uh, was actually the first one on that one, on that, which led to a lot of issues because customers complained they could not send emails anymore as port 25 was blocked. Um, in the course of that, um, the providers of those said mail servers introduced the submission protocol. Essentially, it's the same, but we use a different port of 587 instead of the standard SMTP protocol on 25. This helped, obviously, not just because on 25 um, we have only the communication between the mail servers themselves, um, but also on those dedicated ports for submission on 587 for uh, the start TLS version of that one and for port 465 with TLS encryption, uh, we now have the possibility to accept solely authenticated emails. Why is this important? I will come to back. I will come back to that later in the talk. As we're technical, um, my first choice of mail server is currently Postfix. I'm aware that there are some others around, but I think Postfix is the easiest to um, adjust and administer at that point. Um, if you do want to configure your submission port. Uh, you take a look at your master.cf configuration file, um, most likely in the most recent versions of Debian especially, you will find that the submission port is already there, um, which is then, where is my mouse pointer? Here it is. Uh, quite easy to adjust. So you uncomment the, the submission section. Uh, you might add something of a syslog name to indicate that the client is now using the submission protocol here. Um, of course, we want to enable the, uh, the SASL authentication. Otherwise, obviously, uh, we would not accept any mails. And the most important change to the standard SMTP port is we only want to accept mails that have been authenticated properly with username and password or other means and nothing else. This port, the 587, is completely closed. Um, the other Restrictions, hello restrictions and similar are purely cosmetical, not directly cosmetical, but it helps that if a client is unable to configure their mail client properly, um, we do not want to reject them, um, even if they have uh, already authenticated properly. Good. Now we have established we, uh, means to send the messages into the internet. Now our sending mail server needs to be able to actually deliver the message to the recipient mail server. Of course, um, I think we are experts on that one here and have heard, heard that one before. We need an MX record. MX records are uh, published in the DNS name, DNS system, um, which is quite easy to administer, I think. 
And for just a side note here, um, you configure your, the priority, which gives you, if you do have more than one MX record in place, for example, if you might use some proprietary systems of Gmail or Office 365, the ability to defer spammers, because they actually, at least in the last 10 years, preferred the higher priority, because they think they can get to our backup MX server and thus easily um, circumvent the main measures on the main mail server, and that obviously is something we want to not have, to not open up our systems for those spammers. Good. Now we have the technical background uh, more or less established. Uh, what I did not mention here is authentication. In 1969, we didn't have that, which means you can easily fake any sender you want to have in your emails, um, either it's a from name, it's an envelope sender, anything like that, um, there is no validation whatsoever. This changed over the last 10, 15 years, something like that, um, when new protocols, which I would like to introduce to you, have been published, uh, not just published, but also now get widely accepted. Um, to explicitly state an ad here um, is a difference in the from header that you have in your emails, um, and that your main client adds to the body of the email, um, and the so-called envelope from. The envelope from is used in the SMTP protocol when you actually send the message. The from is not that relevant anymore because it's only part of the body. So if you want to display something properly, use the from um, one, but for the technical terms and the technical validation, the envelope from is the actual relevant um, sender validation in that case. Um, what's the difference or how you configure that? That's especially relevant, for example, if you have your uh, online shop or some automa uh, automa automated other means that um, you configure in a way that, for example, the envelope from is your internal mail uh, system, but the public from address is the one that the customer sees. Obviously, this helps because you get the uh, bounces back to another address that then the um, support team, for example. The first protocol um, that I would like to, to talk about here is the sender policy framework, SPF. SPF is a way of means to authorize client IP addresses. Client IP addresses um, are now different to the ones that actually use the submission protocol. We are now talking on the communication, about the communication between a mail server client and this the receiving one on the other hand, which is... Um, then, in this case, the client that needs to be authorized in the DNS record of the SPF um, policy, uh, framework. How is this implemented? Um, technically, you activate it by adding another TXT record. Um, this is actually enough. So once you have de uh, decided on how, uh, which clients you want to authorize, you add your SPF record to your DNS entry, uh, domain name, and you're done with that on the sending side. On the receiving side, obviously something needs to be, be considered that you are actually uh, able to validate the uh, DNS records presented here. Um, take note, um, SPF has a very hard limitation on DNS lookups, and this is a very strict limitation. After 10 uh, DNS lookups that are presented in the SPF record, um, the validation of the SPF record is terminated. So if you happen to have an 11th, um, because, for example, your marketing de department decided they want to now include something like Paro or other S uh, ASS uh, services, um, you might end up in a situation where emails are not delivered because your DNS, your SPF record is too long. Um, to add here as well, SPF is a means of authorizing the client IP address and it's working on the envelope from. So you do not want to have mail forwards there are people who do want to have that, but please discourage them of using these mail forwards if you have enabled SPF. Yes, I'm aware there is a thing called SRS, the sender rewriting scheme. You don't want to do that. This only complicates things. Try to get your users, if you enable SPF, and ask them to use proper um, other technical um, forwarding measures, for example, use um, the fetch mail or similar me means. Um, Google calls it Sammeldienst on German. Um, it has the ability that um, you successfully terminate any um, incoming spam mails because they are actually delivered to a mailbox. 
um, and you do not have the hassle of um, talking about SPF with the forwards. And of course, you, don't, you only need to argue about the customers and your clients, if you have them, um, about why forwardings have been disabled. How does this look? Um, for our own domain name, this is obviously activated as well. So we have included a central SPF record for our uh, systems, which is here included on our domain name. And every other mail server is explicitly denied. This is the dash all. If you are a bit unsure, you can also use the tilde, um, the is it called ampersand? No, um, the tilde instead of the dash, which then says, OK, I'm not so sure. Please, um, anything which um, fails to validate this SPF record, treat it as, well, I don't know this exactly, um, but don't explicitly reject the email. In our central mail server um, SPF record, we have um, added the whitelist of our actual mail server, which is a bit more. And you here have the advantage that obviously there is no other DNS record, so you will not fail the 10 DNS lockup rule. Um, if you want to, we want to talk about this in detail, um, please feel free to do so afterwards. And I can also well, mention any more about that. Now we have validated how, which mail servers are actually able to send the emails, uh, which we have explicitly allowed. But is the email changed somehow? Has the content been tampered with? For that, DKM, the domain key identified mail, has been initially published by Yahoo. Then it was called just domain key. Um, it's actually quite relevant. Um, some of you might remember um, WikiLeaks and the Hillary Clinton emails um, of that time uh, when she tried to get, uh, become president of the United States. And these emails did have already the DKM signatures in them, which allowed everyone else, as DKM is uh, consistent of a public and a private um, cryptography uh, key, to actually validate the authenticity of these emails. So you could take these emails from Wikileaks, uh, put them in your main client or any other DKM validation tool, and see, OK, this email has actually been sent and processed by a mail server that is completely validated by DKM and, and has been uh, confirmed to do so. For those of you who have never, ever seen this signature, um, DKM works by changing your email after it has been accepted by the submission port on your mail server. Uh, we add another header, and this header includes, um, first of all, the signature that we have used, um, and it also includes the headers. Uh, where is my mouse pointer? OK, it doesn't work. The headers that are now cryptographically signed and everything else, which is not explicitly listed here in these header fields, is not confirmed and signed by DKM. Obviously, this has, so you can be sure that the email now has, uh, is, is actually live. Uh, recommendations. Uh, the so-called identifier um, you could and may change from time to time to, for example, keep that up to date and change your system from 512 bits of a private key to, for example, 2048 bit. In the last five years, I would have said, please do not use the 2048 bit version because there are DNS servers that are unable to do, handle that DNS record. Because on the other side, if you want to validate and everyone does want to validate, that's like backups that did not uh, test uh, pass uh, restore. Um, you want to validate that, and for that you need the public version of your DKM signature, and this one is published in the DNS record as well. Um, pay attention if you do have any um, ready-made or hoster-provided um, interfaces. The signature, especially with the 2048-bit public key, can get a bit longer. So there might be a limitation of 255 characters. If there is, please reach out to your provider and ask them to fix this um, so you can actually publish um, your DN uh, DKM key. Good. Now we have valid SPF records for our authorized clients. And we have established means that um, the email has not been changed. Question is, what happens if you do receive an email that has passed successfully through SPF 
but is not properly DKM signed because, for example, you forgot to configure your new Exchange server. That happens to use the same IP addresses, so it's valid on SPF, but it does not sign yet your emails. For that, DMARC has been published and now in active use, which means that DMARC, the Domain Message Authentication Reporting and Conformance System, um, is another DNS record. Uh, obviously, we rely on that one a lot. And what DMARC does, it states a policy. So each time a mail server that does support DMARC, obviously you need to integrate that, um, receives an email from, from your domain, it will check on that DMARC policy. And in that DMARC policy, we can, for example, specify that we require, first of all, um, SPF and DKM to pass. And second, what happens if you do not pass these DMARC policies? Um, as in, you have an email that fails this one. In that case, you define the action on that one. And in our case, uh, the action is rejected. I don't want to ha have emails that do not pass um, SPF or DKM um, signatures. What I do want, um, I do want to have a report on that one, which means the moment this email, some spammer decides to send an email that is not covered by SPF, um, the recipient mail server is kindly asked to notify us with, first of all, the original email that has not passed these tests, and second, um, additionally, um, information when this uh, occurred and, of course, why this one, uh, did not pass through. If you do want to have that, um, please check your reports periodically. Periodically means not just once a year, uh, but more often, um, especially that's the case when you have um, systems and a lot more email traffic because, for example, also the other providers provide you, if you do configure it, um, with regular information, how many emails did they receive, how many pass uh, successfully, how many failed. Um, so you do want to have a look in your DMARC report mailbox. Of course, this is easier said than done. Um, the email mailbox can grow, as I mentioned, but for that, don't worry, there are parsers publicly available. Um, they scrape and parse and process the, this mailbox and kindly enough put everything in Elasticsearch where you can easily then use Kibana to uh, process and check your emails on, on that one, your reports. Um, if you feel keen on that one, uh, you can also specify an HTTP URL, then you get nice HTTP requests and you do not need to worry about uh, email processing, etc. And lastly noted, if you do have more than one mail uh, address or one, one than, more than one domain, please do use one central mailbox. If you do so, uh, you need to add an additional mail uh, DNS record for that specific domain um, so that you are actually able to receive foreign reports on your external and centralized email address. Good. Now we have successfully determined that the email is valid, that we actually want to receive it, that nothing has been tampered with, but we are still not sure if the NSA is sitting on our um, least line between our data center and the mail server. Um, and for that, obviously, we want to secure uh, the transport between our servers. Um, I have initially already mentioned that sub the submission port does have um, start TLS, obviously um, the best choice here, or you want to have the old standard TLS port. Um, I don't want to talk now about how you get certificates. There is Let's Encrypt. Please uh, feel uh, free to use that one um, with whatever ACME client you have. Um, but you obviously want to have transport security with uh, proper certificates here um, as well. Question is, Star TLS on port 25 is still the standard. We don't have standard enforced security, which means that if Sad mentioned uh, third letter agency is sitting on your line and is able to actually interfere with the traffic, they might be able to tamper with the um, SMTP protocol on the, on the recipient side and, for example, remove the line that would allow the client to initiate star TLS. How do we now conquer that challenge? In that case, uh, there are multiple um, alternatives. The first one would be Dane, the DNS-based authentication of named entities. Um, Dane is actually quite nice. Uh, 
you are there able to publish for specific ports and services. In our case, uh, in my case now, I took the example of uh, the Munich provider of Sys4. And you are there not, able to, not just able to publish the DNS records on port 25, but also on 443 or other services that rely on TCP or similar means. And there you publish the certificate hashes. You can publish not just the hashes of your certificates themselves, obviously, but that's encrypt. This changes every three months, months so you do not really want to do that. Um, so you publish the certificate authorities that you are using to sign your actual mail server certificate. Now, bad example, uh, let's encrypt change that as well, if you do remember the last week. Um, but in the end, uh, the CA certificate is the one that changes less often than your actual um, mail server certificate. Dane has one advantage, disadvantage, whatever you might put it. It requires DNSSEC. If you do not have enabled DNSSEC on your domain, you are unable to use Dane here. If you do want to have that or not, is completely on your um, end to decide. Um, I personally think DNSSEC helps, uh, but I'm not sure if it is actually able to, if we are able to roll that out publicly in, in a way that it will secure the rest of the internet as well. Um, now, um, how is Dane actually working and who validates this now published DNS record? Uh, the sender, when it's connecting to the mail server of the recipient of the MX record, uh, it will check if there is this DNS record published, and of course if a DNS tag is active, and it is then able to verify if the certificate that has been presented by the recipient mail server is actually valid, and if the client, the sender, is talking to the correct mail server. As I mentioned, not just once, um, you require DNSSEC. If you are unable to do so, there is now something new-ish. Uh, new-ish as in, I know there is an RFC, but honestly, aside of Google, I have not yet found another provider that is actually, actually implementing MTA-STS. MTA-STS is the strict transport security for your mail transfer agents, obviously. Um, and it is the alternative if you are unable to activate DNSSEC on your domain or simply if you don't want to do that. Uh, what's the take here? The take is that um, we want to ensure that we as a mail server client are actually talking to the proper recipient mail server. And for that it has been decided that while we cannot enforce like we do with port 443 on HTTPS, um, the secure transfer on our SMTP port. Um, so we publish another policy, another text record, with the actual ID of the policy that we now use, and we use HTTPS. Simple as that. Um, simple as that, as in we already know how to validate a proper um, HTTP certificate record, so we publish an well-known article, uh, another TXT file in this case, and in these, this policy, we add the MX records that we have, you may add uh, wildcards, and then our sending mail server is able to determine which MX record they should be talking to. Um, if you now have gone through all the hoops that I have presented, um, you might use a tool called Mail Tester. Uh, you will access that site, uh, you get a temporary email address, you send your email to that temporary email address, wait 5 to 10 to 15 seconds, something like that, and it will neatly show you if you have successfully passed uh, your DKM signatures, um, if they are valid, if you have an SPF record, if it does work, uh, what your MX record does, and everything else which you might have, uh, you might want to look out for, and that's actually quite nice. It's not open source. Um, they want to sell you the service, um, but for the once in a while test, if my new domain does work, um, please feel free to use that one as well. Good. I have now published everything that I want to talk about on the sender side, now on the more technical part, how to configure that on the receiving mails. Um, technically speaking, uh, some services. The open DKM is quite nice easy to adjust and configure. For DMARC, we rely on OpenDMARC as well. 
Um, SPF, there is a Python script for that one, which works quite nice. And there is even an, uh, an S, uh, MTA STS resolver, which works as a daemon. You hook it in in your postfix configuration, um, actually all, all four of them. And they will, postfix will ask them if everything is working. And if not, you are, well, the mail is being rejected. This is not anti-spam. Anti-spam is actually uh, different to that. We are now talking, I have been now talking only about the validation and the authentication of, of the emails to make sure that you as a sender are doing everything right in this regard. We, only are, we are only able to detect phishing and spoofing, but we are not able to talk about the content if this is actually another Volksbanken spam email or similar, similar to that. If you do want to have um, anti-spam, there are a lot of means um, available. Uh, post, post screen to be noted as postfix uh, specific. We have black and white listing, gray listing. You want to analyze uh, your content using spam assassin. You may rely on distributed hash networks. And of course now there is rspamd, which now is a successor, I would say, to uh, spam assassin. If you do want to store emails, you have dovecot. I think there is nothing else left. Um, in, in the open source world, and obviously in the end, if you want to use and access your emails, you can use two means to do that. Um, the old one, POP3, I don't think I need to mention any more about that, and the new one, IMAP, which should actually be the preferred one. And I think, in my choice, please do use IMAP or JMAP if you want to talk on JSON and HTTPS. Um, JMAP is going to be supported on Dovecot as well very soonish. Um, mail mailing list has been talking about that one a lot. Um, in the end, it's the same as IMAP, but only on HTTPS. Good. I think I managed to put everything in the 30 minutes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the talk. Does anyone have any questions on that one? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Everybody knows everything about email. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, so, question: If I have uh, a number of uh, servers, servers um, on the same provider, so technically I can run my own uh, DNS on that. The question is uh, whether I want that. Um, I don't. Get the question. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, whether it's a good idea to run my own DNS servers. Um, you don't need to. Any to you may do that, um, but you don't need to do that. Um, we do run our own, but you can also rely on on uh, Cloudflare if you want to do that. They are quite quite fast. Um, you can configure everything as long as you have a valid DNS server, which is publicly reachable, and of course, not that slow in responding to to the queries. So. There is no need to actually have your own set of name servers. You can rely on anything that's uh, provided to you. Okay, thanks. And uh, what about um, the alternative uh, implementations of the servers that you mentioned? Like, uh, what about Exim? Do, do you have any experience with that? <laughs> I actually managed to avoid Exim. I know it has some nice features, especially when you want to integrate SQL databases for that. Um, but I really hope that uh, XM is not lagging behind Postfix in any way. Um, so there should be the same means available to communicate with the services that I've described, OpenDKM, et cetera. Um, so the outside configuration should be the same, only how to configure, how to connect it with the actual main servers might differ. But mm -hmm. I'm no exp XM expert, so I have to defer that question. Okay, so how do you see the like the community and support literature, whatever? Because I'm still on send, send mail, and <laughs> I'm considering moving to some of. We can talk afterwards. Um, yeah, okay. Should not be, be a big deal to to, to find this out um, how XM integrates those services. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Well, in that case, I have one. Um, the only thing left, Dovecot? No. <laughs> What about queer? <laughs> I don't want to open up any, any discussions like XM versus Postfix or uh, Courier versus Dovecot. Um, I think Dovecot has the now more advanced feature that set. 
Um, it is in that way a bit superior to Dovecot, but this is my uh, to, to Courier, but this is my personal opinion on, on that take. So uh, there are alternatives available, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Cyrus. Cyrus, of course. Cyrus, yes, of course there are other mail servers available. Um, please feel to, free to use whatever you, you want to store your emails. Uh, that's your choice. <laughs> Good. Then, thank you for the attention. Side note, we're hiring. Um, if you do want to know and talk about more about uh, mails, um, that's actually my personal topic uh, of the last 15, 20 years, um, feel free to chat me up afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>